This is the amazing world of hyper living in today. Total rubbish. But I'll start you off with some of it because Jim Dale, my opponent, uses this sort of hype as his argument. He never ever actually goes against the evidence I provide at these meetings. And today I'll probably be doing another one that later, the, later this afternoon, that's Sunday the 26th, on the Great British Debate. So I'll add that to the end of this. But let's start with the UN and this total nonsense. The release today, July has already seen the hottest three-week period over, ever recorded, the three hottest days on record, and the highest ever ocean temperatures for this time of year. Climate change is here, it is terrifying, and it is just the beginning. The era of global warming has ended, the era, the era of global boiling has arrived. Now I'll play the segment um, from GB News that I appeared on. And then I'll play it again and give you the background and the proof of everything I say. Good afternoon, it's fast approaching 26 minutes after 3 o'clock. This is a GB News, we're live on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Akwe and it's time for climate control. We discuss and debate the topic around the climate. Now, ahead of COP28, which is set to begin next Thursday, the United Nations Environmental Programme has warned that nations must go further than their current pledges in order to tackle global warming. So. For climate control, I'm asking, is the UK government doing enough? Joining me in the studio, meteorologist, meteorologist, <laughs> and social commentator Jim <laughs> Dale, alongside climate scientist Paul Burgess. So, I'm going to start with you, Paul Burgess. All right. Are, are the UK doing enough? They're doing too much. Uh, let me explain why. Um, I, I always produce the facts. This is the CO2 curve for the world, which everyone accepts. There's no deep, deep If you hold that very still, so we can... Okay. And you no keep talking. This. Okay. Now, Tony Heller... Um, a skeptic plotted all the different conferences onto the CO2 curve. They make no difference at all. No, nothing at all. So insanity is called doing the same thing many times over, expecting a different result. So it makes no difference. What we're doing, if I now show you the second graph. What's that? That is a graph of the CO2 being produced by the different continents. That so what's the one at the top? Asia. Asia. This, city from Asia, yeah. These are the Western countries like America and Europe. At the 11. very bottom, you've got America. Yes. Now, we've reduced it very slightly. We're in we... the middle. Pardon? We're in the middle. The middle is North America and Europe. But that's North well, America. Well, listen, next Europe, time you've got stuff like that, give it to us and we'll try and put it on the screen. Okay, digitally. fine. So that's North America and Europe. But the, this growth here is now even accelerating. Um, China's just announced a big increase in coal. We're now producing, we're now burning more coal than ever in human history. Yeah. We're now burning more oil than ever in human history. Uh, so um, just, to, just to ignore that and say we've got to do more, whilst the effect of that, where I come from in Wales, is Tartar Steel are making 3,000 people redundant, putting in an electric furnace that actually is destroying 3,000 jobs, which would probably knock on to 10,000 in the area. So a total area is economically devastated for the sake of nothing. And worse than that, we're paying 500 million pounds worth of taxpayers' money towards it. And worse than that, we can't even make proper steel with it. So you can't mm. make construction steel or boat steel or bridge steel. So you we have, have to, to import it, that. Import it from China. Yeah, so that is a madness. That's what I want to say. So he says, he says that we're doing too much and other nations should be doing more? Should, are you saying others should be doing more? No, because I want more CO2, so they're doing yeah. us a favour. OK, <laughs> so um, eyes wide shut, Paul. That's basically where you are. You've, you've missed the last few years of what's happening globally in terms of what the CO2 levels are doing, in terms of, it, in terms of increasing uh, global temperatures. This, this week we had two days where uh, temperatures uh, uh, reached plus two degrees, over two degrees, not 1.5 but two degrees on single days, consecutive days, globally averaged out, which is a signpost for, you know, in terms of going forward. So is this government doing enough? Nowhere near enough. It's put the brakes on. It talks but, but a bad talk. But, but, look, but what's it... happened to us? Though we've gone this, this two whatever you're saying. Yeah. What? Well, where? I don't know where they're taking the temperature from. But irrespective of that, what thousands has happened of, to us? What thousands is... of stations. What's happened, happened, what's happened to us? Happened you, to us? You, as, as I said to, to, uh, two seconds ago, eyes wide shut. You've just got well, to look at. Uh, it does mean it does mean that you're not looking at what's going on around the world in terms of the climate incidents, the climate. 
uh, catastrophes that have happened this year, not just this year, but the year before, and, and consecutively from that point onwards, they're only going to get worse. I mark it now, 2024, even before we get to New Year's Eve, I'll say to you now, it will continue. There will be further catastrophes caused by climate change. That's why uh, they've made that warning about not exceeding, to, uh, uh, so, so heading for 2.5. Two, two, give two me, point in five. your view, the, the latest catastrophe that has happened recently. What's the latest uh, one? Uh, well, I th look, it's, it's virtually every day there's something new. Uh, virtually every single day and uh, I, I guess the, the the latest one will be the Antarctic ice shelf on the western side starting to uh, melt faster than than what's been seen previously there's a massive iceberg that's just dislocated itself and is moving so, away the size so, so of saying, greater London so you're saying an iceberg that's broken away is one of the examples of the climate catastrophe it's it's a sign it, without a shadow of a doubt it's ice melting go to the glaciers in Switzerland in Austria so they're ice, receding like the crazy one. so he says um, Paul that an iceberg uh, melting is one of the biggest climate catastrophes that has just happened mm. recently well, the first point I made, by the way, is no matter what we do, it makes no difference at all. We're just destroying our economy. That's the first point. The second point is, is he, Jim doesn't understand what climate is because he keeps quoting weather, and that is not climate. As regards Antarctica, I've got it here. NASA have declared openly and truthfully that every decade the temperatures drop by a degree. For 40 years, oh, Antarctica's cool. <coughs> and you know what cools Antarctica? And by the way, the scientists on both sides agree on this, as does the satellite. Actually, CO2 cools Antarctica because of the Antarctic inversion. Obviously, that's going into some science. Paul, I, don't, true. I, I really no, hold on. I really don't know where you get your information from well, because you come on here. No, listen, you come on here and you go completely and utterly against uh, against climate scientists. Up to uh, you know, nearly a hundred percent. Not just climate scientists. You, you mentioned NASA. NASA are not on your side. They never have been. But the quite polar opposite. The World Meteorological Organization. Uh, exactly the same. Your bits of paper are worthless because they are fed. I can tell you now, they're fed from the fossil fuel industry. Simple. And that's. Well, what, that's, that's what you've been taken in with. Anybody, I actually fork out a lot of money to do what I'm doing. I'm not subsidised. I subsidise it. Even but you, you, today, you're out. All I get are my expenses, look. not any money. So, so look, you, you're, look, you, you're completely out on a limb. Hang on, no, let, let Paul respond. I'm, I can quote the IPCC. Here's the table from the AR6 report. All this extreme weather you're talking about is not true. Your side does not support it. No matter, I've got it all here, and these are official things. I, so, I, so the record temperatures that we've seen in in, in the last year, 2023, 2022, well, the 40 you, degrees C that we saw, 40.3 degrees that we saw in the UK, plus lots and oh lots yeah, of other records actually falling. Let's do that. And don't I've say, got the, I've got and don't say for one second, oh, that was an well, airport. Where, where was it? Where was it was it? on the side of Heathrow Runway. Uh, no, it was Coningsby, actually. It was Coningsby. Coningsby uh, is an RAS. Is in Lincolnshire, After in the, the middle of nowhere. Take. So what about Aberporth? What about other areas? I'm sorry. There, there is you're hundreds of stations. Well, you don't understand climate. I, climate. I perfectly understand climate. Time. I understand the and difference. I am using Paul. all the science. I'm not only that. After each one of these confrontations, Jim, I post a video and give every reference to everything I've claimed every time, and that's to protect GB News because I'm a skeptic. Yes, I am on the skeptic side, right? But I'm a scientist. I'll tell you what science is about, Jim. Well, well listen, we're running out of time, so okay. you've got ten seconds to say it. All right, science, science is about is finding, about finding the it truth. It doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. It's got to agree with observation to be right. That's a fundamental. I'm a yeah, yeah. Well, listen, Jim Dale, meteorologist and social commentator and Paul Burgess, thank you so much. Right, so what are your thoughts? GBviews at GBnews.com. Always a pleasure to get those two on. This is GB News on the way, my political spotlight. I'll be speaking to Reform UK's London Merrill candidate. Joining me in the studio, meteorologist, meteorologist, and social commentator <laughs> Jim on. Dale, alongside climate scientist Paul Burgess. So I'm going to start with you, Paul Burgess. All right. Are, are the UK doing enough? They're doing too much. Uh, let me explain why. Um, I, I always produce the facts. This is the CO2 curve for the world, which everyone accepts. There's no deep, deep If you deep. hold that very still, so we can. Okay. Can you no keep talking? This. Okay. This is the graph, and. As you can see, you plot all the different conferences right up to Cairo on it. And those conferences make no difference at all. This week we're about to have another COP, COP28. 70,000 people apparently are coming to it. And it's just hot air. They don't do any. It has no effect. So what I put on there was quite a famous quote. Originally, I think, to Einstein, but maybe not. 
insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So I'm accusing the COP meetings of having no effect at all. And if you look at that curve, it's curving upwards. In other words, CO2 is accelerating. Now, for the record, this is not my curve. This comes from NOAA, and it comes from a station at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. It is the internationally accepted CO2 curve. It is what people quote to you when they tell you how many parts per million there is in the atmosphere. So this is simple fact. There is no way around this. And I needed to explain that before I carry on. In future, I'm going to try and get these graphs into GB News before the discussion. The problem is I often don't know exactly what's going to be asked of me. Now, Tony Heller, um, a sceptic, plotted all the different conferences onto the CO2 cap. They make no difference at all. No, nothing at all. So insanity is called doing the same thing many times over, expecting a different result. So it makes no difference. What we're doing, if I now show you the second graph. What's that? That is a graph of the CO2 being produced by the different continents. This second graph is a graph of the CO2, as I've just stated, from the different continents. That top curve, just look at it, is Asia. And look at the recent few years, that really sharp increase right at the top there. That is what's going on now as we transfer our industries over to Asia. We in the United States and Europe, there, North America and Europe there, have actually slightly reduced our CO2 emissions at enormous costs, and we're about to face the big barrage of costs, trillions, in doing more. And it makes no difference at all, really, to the world CO2, which is accelerating upwards. So this is my point, that anything we're doing now is meaningless. This graph, the sources are all at the bottom. You can obtain it from World of Data. Anyone can get it as per the previous graph. So this shows that we are really doing nothing. I mean, forget it. It is simply absurd not, well, to ignore this. That's so what's the one at the top? Asia. Asia. This, the from Asia, yeah. These are the Western countries like America and Europe. At the very bottom, you've got America. Yes. Now, we've reduced it very slightly. We're in we've... the middle. Pardon? Well, we're in the middle. The middle is North America and Europe. That's North well, America Well, listen, next Europe, time sorry. you've got stuff like that, give it to us and we'll try and put it on the screen. OK, digitally. fine. So that's North America and Europe. But the, this growth here is now even accelerating. Um, China's just announced a big increase in coal. We're now producing, we're now burning more coal than ever in human history. Just to back up my statement there, and I had this graph ready, but I did not show it. There wasn't an opportunity. This is the sources of energy that the world have used since the Industrial Revolution, basically. And you can see that the oil there, which is green, um, is growing tremendously now, more than ever before. And so is the coal, which is sort of orangey colour there. And so is gas. They are all growing and are being used more than ever before in history. So we're now burning more fossil fuels than in human history. And to pretend we're not is silly, right? By the way, this is a good thing because we're adding CO2 to the atmosphere, which is good. But that's a separate point. Yeah. We're now burning more oil than ever in human history. Uh, so um, just, to, just to ignore that and say we've got to do more, whilst the effect of that, where I come from in Wales, is Tartar Steel are making 3,000 people redundant, putting in an electric furnace that actually is destroying 3,000 jobs, which would probably knock on to 10,000 in the area. So a total area is economically devastated for the sake of nothing. And worse than that, we're paying £500 million worth of taxpayers' money towards it. And worse than that, we can't even make proper steel with it. So you can't mm. make construction steel or boat steel or bridge steel. So you we have, have to, to import that. Import it from China. Yeah, so that is a madness. That's what I want to say. So he says, he says that we're doing too much and other nations should be doing more? Should, are you saying others should be doing more? No, because I want more CO2, so they're doing yeah. us a favour. OK, <laughs> so um, eyes wide shut, Paul. That's basically where you are. You've, you've missed the last few years of what's happening globally in terms of what the CO2 levels are doing. So, so I've missed the last few years globally in terms of what CO2 levels are doing. Well, let me show you the fuel use recently. Let me show you, you know, the acceleration that's going on in CO2. What I've reported on is the place in Mauna Loa where you've actually, 
the observatory is that everyone accepts that's what we quote. So when people quote 418 or 420 parts per million, it's from the graph I gave. So what he means by that, I have no idea. But he doesn't give any evidence, just says, I've missed the boat with something, without saying what that something is. I mean, it's just nothing. There's nothing there to grasp hold of. And I think he actually believes himself. Just to drive the point home, this video is from NOAA, the official organization in America that has that observatory in Hawaii. And it's also, it's like the, it's like the USA Met Office for us, but all these different authorities agree. So this is the growth in CO2 over time. And it's quite an interesting graph, actually. And you can see in the right hand part there, it growing. It may also be worth noticing while you're seeing this that the waves, the seasonal waves between the season of winter and summer on the CO2 curve, as, as it's absorbed in the summer, the CO2 given off in the winter and absorbed, those waves are getting slightly bigger. The reason is there's more and more vegetation on Earth as the CO2 is increasing. So I just thought I would point that out to you. Just watch this and then tell me that, you know, I've got it wrong and somehow I'm not up with the latest news. It's this growth in CO2 that is what all the that's what all the alarms about. So I don't know what uh, Jim Dale is saying here that I'm not up to the latest. I mean, the latest is the highest level of CO2 we've seen for a long time. So I, I don't understand him at all. In terms of in terms of increasing uh, global temperatures, this this week we had two days where uh, temperatures uh, uh, reached plus two degrees, over two degrees, not 1.5 but two degrees on a single day. There he is again, confusing two days weather with climate. You cannot take weather events unless you consider them over a very long time and say they're climate. But I actually don't even accept his figures, by the way, but that's a separate argument. So he can't, he doesn't begin to understand what climate is. He really does not. But what happens now gets quite interesting. These consecutive days globally averaged out, which is a signpost for, you know, in terms of going forward. So is this government doing enough? Nowhere near enough. It's put the brakes on. It talks but, but a bad talk. But, Look, but, but making... what's happened to us there? We've gone this, this two, whatever you're saying. Yeah. What, where, I don't know where they're taking the temperature from, but irrespective of that, what thousands has happened of, to us? What's... Thousands of stations. What's happened, happened to us? Happened to us? You, as, as I said to, to, uh, two seconds ago, eyes wide shut. You've just got well, to look at anything. Uh, it does mean, it does mean you're not looking at what's going on around the world in terms of the climate incidents, the climate... Uh, catastrophes that have happened this year, uh, not just this year, but the year before, and, and consecutive from that point onwards. They're only going to get worse. A market now, 2024, even before we get to New Year's Eve, I'll say to you now, it will continue. There will be further catastrophes caused by climate change. That's why uh, they've made that warning about not exceeding, to, uh, uh, so, so heading for 2.5. Two, two, so give two me, point the, in five. your view, the, the latest catastrophe that has happened recently. What that's a lovely question, Nana. I actually, I actually admire her a great deal. I respect her. She cuts to the chase there. Give me a recent catastrophe. Give me, give me something. Now, what the alarmists do at this stage, when they're caught in the headlights by that question, and, and he is, is they'll think of something far away. They'll think of something that we can't see. They'll think of, you know, they think of things like the big plastic garbage patch in the uh, Pacific, because people can't get to it. I've actually sailed through it. It doesn't exist. Um, so she, he will think of something far away now that's not affecting you. But he thought of the wrong one. Watch this. What's the latest one? Uh, well, I th look, it's, it's virtually every day there's something new. Uh, virtually every single day. And I, I guess the, the, the latest one will be the Antarctic ice shelf on the western side starting to uh, melt faster than, than what's been seen previously. There's a massive iceberg that's just dislocated itself and is moving so, away the size so of Greater London. Oh dear, oh dear, Jim. You do drop yourself in it. You're just wanting to spread alarm. So we've got this iceberg the size of London carving off um, from Antarctica. Antarctica's the continent, by the way. But, you know, let, let's just look at this. So let's just look at the people who are there discussing this breakaway, who were there witnessing it. The scientists. They're the British Antarctica exhibition so here's the video jim and just see how you just take anything you grasp anything and try to give an example of climate change well let's ask the scientists who are there jim a massive iceberg has broken away in antarctica we had some communication from our remote instruments on the ice shelf informing us that part of the ice shelf approximately the size of greater london 
uh, carved off at around about uh, 7 to 8 p.m. last night. Glaciologists with the British Antarctic Survey say it measures about 600 square miles. It broke off from the Brunt Ice Shelf, and researchers say they shot this video in 2019, having noticed a crack forming for a few years at that point. They called it Chasm 1 and continued to monitor it, expecting a breakaway event in the future. The timing was a lucky break for scientists working in Antarctica. Our station was situated on the piece of ice shelf that has broken away. Um, so had we not moved it several years ago, um, we would have been in a situation now where we have a station floating off. The good thing is that scientists say this event wasn't caused by climate change. Rather, it's just a naturally occurring process. They also say it won't dramatically affect sea levels. For once, it's an iceberg that isn't a call for concern. <laughs> this is floating ice. I icebergs and floating ice don't change sea level at all. They simply melt and fill the hole that they're already making in the water. It's the same sea level, I'm afraid. So you're saying an iceberg that's broken away is one of the examples of the climate catastrophe? It's it's a sign. It, without a shadow of a doubt, it's ice melting. Go to the glaciers in Switzerland, in Austria. So They're ice, receding like the crazy. Point. So he says, um, Paul, that an iceberg uh, melting is one of the biggest climate catastrophes that has just happened mm. recently. Well, the first point I made, by the way, is no matter what we do, it makes no difference at all. We're just destroying our economy. That's the first point. The second point is... is he, Jim doesn't understand what climate is because he keeps quoting weather, and that is not climate. As regards Antarctica, I've got it here. NASA have declared openly and truthfully that every decade the temperatures drop by a degree. For 40 years, oh, Antarctica's cool. <coughs> and you know what cools Antarctica? And by the way, the scientists on both sides agree on this, as does the satellite. Actually, CO2 cools Antarctica because of the Antarctic inversion. Obviously, that's going into some science. Paul, I, don't, true. I, I really... No, hold on. I now, I've said a few things there, and I really need to give some background to them. Um, the fact is that the extra CO2, or the extra greenhouse gases, actually, in Antarctica um, do the op have the opposite of effect. And the reason is, as you go up in Antarctica, it gets warmer rather than colder like it does in the rest of the world. And so, um, in Antarctica, the extra CO2 causes more cooling. Now, there's absolute proof of this by both the science, which both sides agree on this science, and by observation. And I've explained this in the um, video called More CO2 Please, which you can see um, down, down, down below this video. It's in the links. More CO2 Please. And it ex explains the basic science, actually, that both sides agree on. Where, where both sides depart from this is having warmed by this science, which we all agree on, it's called the Stefan and Bolson curve, and you'll see it. Having warmed by that, um, the alarmists say that causes more warming, that it causes more evaporation and more warming. And so they triple the effect. And this is why, when you look at graphs like this one, you will see that the satellite observations are increasing, that, well, it's been increasing recently, at a rate of one-third of, of the mean of the... Um, computer model observations. So that's where we are with this. Now there's a lot of background, but Jim doesn't even know what the Stefan Boltzmann curve is. Jim doesn't know anything about this. Jim lives on these sort of headlines here. That's what he lives on. And it's very difficult to argue with someone who doesn't know the subject at all. And I'm, I'm finding it quite difficult actually, because we're never getting anything of substance back to lock onto. Anyway, let's carry on with the interview. I really don't know where you get your information from well, because you come on here. No, listen, you come on here and you go completely and utterly against uh, against climate scientists. Up to uh, you know nearly a hundred percent, not just climate scientists. You, you mentioned NASA. NASA are not on your side. They never have been. But they're quite polar opposite. The World Meteorological Organization, exactly the same. Your bits of paper are worthless because they are fed. I can tell you now, they're fed from the fossil fuel industry. He keeps thinking, he, he, he keeps thinking, you know, people like me are paid by the fossil fuel industry. I made it totally clear we're not. And nor do any of the people I respect on my side, the scientists, etc. They're not. It's as simple as that. The exact opposite is true. Jim had three television appearances that day, uh, you know, and he gets paid and makes a profit each one. I don't, right? It's the exact opposite. And this is going to come to a head on the day after, because I'm going to show you the Sunday appearance on the Great Debate, where Jim and I really clashed. So... This is this. Uh, he doesn't know where I'm getting the information from. 
on everything I give. I give the quote. As regards to NASA, I'm quoting his own side. I'm quoting people like Noah and NASA and the IPCC. That's where I'm getting it from. Now, he may not like that. Now, I can tell you why he doesn't understand it. What these organisations do is they put forward propaganda. But when you look at the science they actually give very often, it goes against the propaganda. Because the summary for policymakers, which all the governments go on, is a political document. And the scientists at the last day are six... Um, report behind it said you can't carry on the models are far too hot they're running far too hot you can't but they did they just carried on because there is a political agenda and he Jim has locked on to this political alarmist side but not looking at the data so what better thing for me to do what better thing for me to do than to give him the facts and figures from his own side and he doesn't understand that because he doesn't look at the data he doesn't look at the science he just goes on those headlines it's absurd simple and that's what that's that's what you've been I'm taken in with anybody i actually fork out a lot of money to do what i'm doing i'm not subsidized i subsidize it even but you, you today, you're out all i get are my expenses look, not any money so so look you, you're you, you're completely out on a limb no, 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 no. I, I can quote the ipcc here's the table from the ar6 report all this extreme weather you're talking about is not true your side does not support it this is the official ipcc table from their latest report it's table 12, 12, 1. Chapter 12 as well. Right. You can see here that there is no discernible thing in the historic record, no discernible thing in the historic record for frost, mean precipitation, river flood, heavy precipitation, and fluvial flood, landslide, aridity, hydrological drought, agricultural and ecological droughts, fire weather, mean wind speed, severe wind storms, tropical cyclones, sand and dust storms, snow, glacier and sheet. There is some evidence, they say, of permafrost and lakes and river and sea ice. Heavy snowfall, no evidence of that. Hail, no, no increased frequency of that. Snow avalanche, no increased frequency. Record sea level, coastal flood, coastal erosion. And we're finishing off with nothing in marine heat waves, in ocean acidity, nothing and there is something in ocean salinity, they think, and dissolved oxygen. Now, I will disagree on some of those where they said there is something, but you can see from most of the extreme weather events that they're talking about, except apart from heat, basically, most of them, they're, they're not there. But this is what Jim Dale relies on, and it's his own documents, his own background, his own scientists that he's claiming support him that say the opposite to what he's claiming. No matter, I've got it all here, and these are official things. I, I, so, so the record temperatures that we've seen in 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 the last year, 2023, 2022, well, the 40 you, degrees I, C that we saw, 40.3 degrees that we saw in the UK, plus lots and oh lots yeah, of other records actually falling. Let's do that. And don't I've say, got the, I've got and don't say for one second, all that was an well, airport. Where, where was it? Where was it was it? on the side of Heathrow Runway. Uh, no, it was Coningsby actually. Sorry. Sorry. It was Coningsby. Coningsby is an RAS uh, in Lincolnshire, in the middle of nowhere. So what about Aberporth? What about other areas? Sorry, there is you hundreds of stations. You don't understand climate. I, climate. I perfectly understand climate. Well, there we are again. That's quite interesting in some ways. First of all, he's talking weather again, not climate. But secondly, he refers to the record 40.2 um, heat, etc. That was Heathrow, alongside the actual runway on the runway complex at Heathrow, was the gauge. It's not there for climate. It's there to tell pilots about with the wind and the temperature, etc., at the runway. That's what it's there for. So he then, having gone from that one, don't tell me the runway business, goes to Coningsby, which he claims in the middle of nowhere. It's an RAF airport. It was, the temperature was taken after a tornado jet had taken off. I mean, this is meaningless. And then having gone Coningsby, that's no good either. Go to the next one. This is not a way to argue, Jim. This is ridiculous. The facts are, a recent study shows, by, by the Connollys and Willie Soon, shows that 75% of the hundreds of climate stations age up in the Europe, they looked at in the European area, 75% of them had gradually entered an urban heat island as populations grew and they stayed still, as it were. So that's the way what I'm arguing with him. If I had more time, I could drill him down on this. But because it's so limited, the time we have, I can just go bang, bang and get really nowhere. 
so at least I can get rid of my frustration by making these videos. And Jim, you're always invited on to give an unedited. I'll publish anything you give me on my videos. I'll publish them on my channel so you can counter anything I say. You're always welcome to do that. But I know you're a very busy man. He seems to have about 20 TV appearances a week, you know. So I'm going to move on now to what happened the following day. Um, GB News phoned me up and said, look, can you come on for the Great British Debate? And I thought I was going to have more time. I was mistaken in that. But I'm always willing to come on. And this time it was a Zoom call type call. So I, at least I didn't have to travel for 13 hours like I normally do to get a few minutes in. So here we go. This is the actual excerpt now from the Great British Debate on the following day, Sunday the 26th of November. It is 24 after 5. Welcome if you just joined me. Thank you. It's great to have your company. But you've missed quite a bit. But don't worry, because it's time now for the Great British Debate this hour. I'm asking, should richer countries pay poorer countries for climate change? COP28, yeah, we're on 28 of these things now. It commences in Dubai this Thursday. How are they going to get there? They're going to fly. China and other developing nations are set to be required to contribute to a fund designed to support countries stricken by climate disaster. Governments will establish a fund focused on addressing loss and damage to restore communities affected by the impacts of climate change, reportedly accelerated by the industrialisation of developing nations. Should richer companies pay poorer countries for climate change? That is the question. Joining me to discuss, uh, Philip Blond, former advisor to David Cameron, Jim Dale, meteorologist, Paul Burgess, climate scientist, Matthew Stadlin, political commentator. Uh, so this is the question. Should richer countries pay poorer ones for climate change? I'm going to start with you, Paul Burgess. Well, the answer to that is no, we shouldn't. I mean, basically, even the IPCC state very clearly that on most of these things, except for warming, actually, on most of these things, there is no discernible difference. In other words, there's no more extreme weather for droughts, floods, hurricanes, etc. It's absolutely a myth. This is just weather. And when you study it, when you study climate, which is weather over a long period, it's simply not true. And in fact, you know, all these COP meetings produce absolutely nothing. They don't give any influence on the CO2 output, which is growing tremendously. I've Jim actually Dale. given you some graphs on this. Jim Dale. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Nana. Hi, good afternoon. Paul's uh, speaking out of his host pipe as usual. Uh, climate change is taking place. I'm not going to let you suffer through this twice, so I'm going to interrupt as we go. I've never denied, in fact, I've always said there's climate change. My entire case is that there is climate change all the time. I'm not denying it, but they always put that false straw argument, the straw man argument up to defeat something I've never said. Nana understands this, you shall see later on. But, you know, and the other part there is just an insult in inferring that I'm paid by the petrol or the petrochemical industry, which I'm not, and nor are the scientists on my side. The exact opposite is the truth. Trillions are being spent on the alarmist side. Uh, and um, so, you know, it, it's false from the beginning. And I'm accused, basically, at this point, it's just a personal smear on the petro funding. And secondly, it's a claim that I'm saying there's no climate change, which, of course, my entire argument is that it is, and it's natural. And almost oh, not all of it, by the way, only about 80, 90 percent of it at the moment is natural. But I can show that scientifically. And above all here, and what I've just stated is the IPCC. I've already given you the table where there's no discernible change from the historic evidence, no change in frequency. So I've given you that in the previous video, in the previous section on this video. And that is how bad it is. These people are brainwashed people who are just following a, a journalistic agenda, a, a mainstream media agenda that has got nothing to do with the facts. And what's happening is the IPCC, which is a government-controlled and a government organisation, actually publishes reports that are very different very often to the scientific work behind it. But people don't read the scientific work, they just look at the headlines. That's what's going on here. Anyway, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let this carry on. Um, in terms of the question, uh, should uh, richer countries be paying poorer countries? Well, we're looking at Latin America, we're looking at sub-African uh, countries there in, in terms of uh, the poorer countries and where they are. And they are the ones that are most affected and have been most affected by climate change. And when we say affected, mm. we're not talking about the kind of thing that might affect, say, uh, uh, the UK, for example, a, a bit of a flood there and we get over it. Uh, this is having no food. This is having no, no water to drink. 
So if you take that to its, 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 its end point, when there's nothing to eat and nothing to drink, when climate change does hit, then guess what happens? It's called climate migration. And those boats that uh, get talked about quite often, well, they're going to be in demand, hell of a demand. And that's why richer countries should contribute commensurately to right. poorer countries to ensure that they don't fall down. All right, but, but before you carry on, though, Jim, just apologise for that, because that's not very nice, telling me he's talking about out of space pub. I think that's wrong. <laughs> Sorry, there again. Can you apologise, please, um, to, uh, to Paul, because that's not fair, talking out of his hose pipe. That's not acceptable. Come on. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a petrol hose pipe. I think it's absolutely fair. I won't apologise. It's absolutely fair. Well, I, I think can I just answer that? Yeah, go on, you can, can answer I just respond, respond to that. Yeah, I mean, I make no money out of this appearance. I make no money out of any of my TV appearances at all. It just covers my expenses. I am down personally thousands of pounds. So I don't make any money like you do, Jim, out of this. So when you talk about funding, etc., I'm, I'm familiar and friends with many climate scientists, and they all, none of them I know, make any money from Petro. It is an absolute smear. And if you're going to do this on air, no, if you're going to do this on air, which you do continually, give me the evidence. I appear uh, on air with you uh, all. Okay, okay, what well, is it? This, this, this apology thing hasn't gone well, so I'm going to go to Matthew Stadlin. Well, there we are. Though the point to pick out there is how much African and South American countries are suffering. Well, actually, we've got record crops. I'm just going to show you, as I'm talking, a few of the record crops around the world, of which a lot of which, not all, because improved farming, fertiliser, various things, but somewhere between 30 and 60% of it is due to the extra CO2 we're putting in the atmosphere. They're gaining enormously. The Sahara Desert is contracting because, of course, plants are being starved of CO2. Things like cereals, things like rice, very important in the third world, are now at record levels. So it's the exact opposite of what these people are saying. But facts don't matter in their world. It's all a left-wing sort of, I don't know, ridiculous thing. And, you know, I mean, I've also shown, by the way, that CO2 is going like this, and it's not going to change. Don't think that's going to change. I'm going to have my way. And more CO2 is going to be a great benefit to the world, and it's going to happen anyway. So pretend it's not is ridiculous. So Jim is just going against the facts, and he can't give a single example of where the third world is really affected, but he'll touch onto the left-wing things about the boats and things like this, you know, to make you scared. Scaremongering, not science, not facts. Let's carry on. No, I have to say, I find it extraordinary that Paul says that climate change is a myth and this is not happening. What he actually said, of course, was that extreme weather is not happening. And I quoted the IPCC as the source of that. So this is a total straw man argument from a person who I've actually clashed with before, who has no understanding of the science and goes on to demonstrate it here. Because the overwhelm, we all know, everyone watching knows, really, in their brains and in their hearts, everyone watching GB News well, this no, afternoon. I, think, I, I, but let, I, just, I don't know what I want to say. I think he knows that it's changing, but it, the way it's changing yeah, and what's yeah, yeah. causing it is everyone, just a correct Everyone theory. knows that, that climate change is man-made and that the overwhelming majority of scientific opinion is behind that. So let's look at that survey that says 97% of scientists agree. Well, it's actually 100% incorrect. The truth is this. The scientific league consensus, the human activity, is very likely causing most of the current global warming, global warming, Cook et al. 2013. Well, he asked 11,944 scientists, but only 7,930 replied. So we're now down to 60 odd percent there. And then 3,896 were marked as agreeing we cause some warming. Well, I'd be in that group as well. You know, the two questions that were asked were, is there global, is, is there global warming? Yes, I'd have answered that, yes. Has man influenced that? Yes. But that is not what was reported. Um, 64 were marked as stating that we caused most of the warming. So we're now down to half a percent of the original 11,000 odd. And 41 actually stated we caused most of the warming, so we're down to 0.3%. Nought were marked as endorsing man-made catastrophe. So that's how these alarmists totally misrepresent data. The recent um, Nobel Prize winner for physics um, got the Nobel Prize and had all these appointments and speeches arranged, all, this, all these engagements. And then when he came out and said, 
no, there's no climate catastrophe happening. And he joined Sintel, a group of 500 scientists or so, against all this alarmism. He was, he was, they stopped all his appointments. They cancelled him. He's now a cancelled physicist. That's not science. Unless you have debate, open debate and so on, it's not scientists. So I don't regard almost any of the alarmists as scientists. And I think it is no. absolutely... Just look at... I, I beg people, just go and look at a graph of the world's climate from, say, 1971 till 2021, and it goes like this. It goes like this. There, the no, funeral dips, but it basically goes like it's a steep hill. And we are in a dangerous situation. Now, it's obviously true that, now. That, that's only 20 it, it's, years. It's, I mean, it's, what, well, what you said, well, the no, graph no, over 20 it's, years. It's 30 years, but we've been well, getting steadily, years, steadily warmer so from the 1950s. We as human beings, of course we're preoccupied with the horrors of what's going on in the Middle East. Of course we're preoccupied with the cost of living, rightly so in this country, that doesn't mean that we can wish climate change away. We have to take it seriously. And in answer to the main question, Nana, of course, richer countries should pay poorer countries. And by the way, if we don't, as your other guests rightly said, we will have many more small boats coming here in the future. This idea that there's been 20 or 30 years of rising temperatures, generally that's true, but it's not quite like that. So this is a little clip from another video I did way back, and it's how the alarmist changed the historic temperature data. It's quite interesting. And of course, the 1930s were the warmest, not just in America, but around the world. Lots of evidence to support that. Lots of evidence to support the medieval warm period was much warmer than today. I'm doing a major video on that soon, well underway with work on that, and so on. So these ideas are taking a small segment, like 20 or 30 years, on a pattern that you need to see maybe over 100 is the problem. These people are just uneducated, all of them actually, as regards climate. They really are, and they, they swallow the hook of alarmism based on the 1999 reports. So, clearly, the 1930s were hotter, and then it cooled, as we know, from the 1940s until 1980, when it warmed again. But clearly, the 1930s were the hottest. But just two years later, in 2001, NASA have a new graph for the same period, and suddenly the 1930s are now cooler than today. But hold on here. I can hear the alarmist cry. You just compared global temperatures here to USA temperatures. That's not fair. But just to make the point, here are the USA temperatures adjusted and it's just the same result. Well, I don't think they're leaving because of climate change. They're clearly leaving here because they get the benefits and they get a nice, they get to be in a hotel. Correct. Music four star. Philip Blonde. Yeah, I just, I just want to sidestep the, the debate on whether climate change is happening. But nobody's debating that. Uh, mm. From my own position, I, I think it clearly is. Look, I think, I think that what's happening is to the great advantage of uh, the West, uh, Britain uh, and Europe, because we're asking countries like China that have moved out of the developing framework, who are on course to be, by the middle of this century, the greatest emitter of of carbon to play on an equal playing field for us with trade. What this allows us to do, quite rightly, is set up green tariffs across the EU, it's also been debated in America, where we don't allow unfair competition between our own domestically produced uh, industrial products that are, compared to the Chinese products, far less uh, uh, causing of carbon-based uh, pollution Carbon-based pollution, uh, plant food pollution, the stuff you're made of, carbon. Carbon-based pollution. What world do these people live in? What he's just pointing out here is the ability to charge green levies, etc., and equalise it so we're all penalising each other for the third world. So China's included in the penalty. There's no chance of that, by the way. There is no chance of China agreeing to this. You know, they will just look after their own people, and I don't blame them for that. But... The idea, all these green tariffs, these are adding to you, normal people. These are adding huge costs to you. They're already doing it in big ways. We've already gone down a path for the last 20 years, which has got you into very high energy prices, which we shouldn't be in. We're already exporting now our steel industry, you know, so that, so, so that we have to buy it in to make steel. In fact, we can't even make the steel for our own defence forces, you know, equipment. That's how it's going to end up. It is ridiculous. So this idea that we all charge each other green, based on what? Based on nothing. 
based on no extremes that are happening. They're actually not happening. In fact, most of the extremes, such as hurricanes, slightly less, tornadoes, a lot less, droughts, significantly less, crop yields up. This is the situation. Uh, I, I watched the Prime Minister at Tuvalu. Um, I think I'll put a shot on here. In Tuvalu, we are living the realities of climate change, sea level rise, as you stand watching me today at COP26. We cannot wait for speeches when the sea is rising around us all the time. Climate mobility must come to the forefront. We must take bold, alternative action today to secure tomorrow. Faftailasi Tuvalu Modeatua. And there we are. He's arguing, you know, give us money. So what's happened in Tuvalu? Oh, it's grown by 2.9%. None of the inhabited islands has sunk. Not one. There's a few sandbanks now that are trying to get that have sunk, which change all the time anyway. That's how bad this alarmism is. It's, it's, it's reached a stage of lunacy. I'll let this man carry on. And therefore we get an equitable trade. We're also looking at China. You've got to have sticks as well as carrots. China has two plans in place, peak carbon production. It's going to have 300 more coal-fired power stations by the mid-century, 300. So China dwarfs and will surpass America as the biggest historic uh, generator of, of carbon pollution by mid-century. So these, what is transformative is actually making China pay and also making the petro states pay rather than just people in the West. This who pays argument is silly. If you had green tariffs, you pay. If you have tariffs on the producers in the Middle East, you pay. It's all passed on. The only people paying in the end for any consumption is the end consumer. If the prices are put up on the way to you, you'll be paying more. It's, it's Walter Mitty economics they're in here. Total Walter Mitty. I'll let him carry on. And also why we should support this, I'll just make one more remark, Aye. is it ensures a more equitable trading arrangement. So we're no longer, our products are no longer competing unfairly against yep. products that don't have to yeah, abide but it, by our yeah, pollution rules. Yeah, but, but, but Philip, the problem with all of that is that, for example, let's take diesel, which we were told to do things because diesel was a wonderful thing and, you know, it turned out to be the spawn of Satan. And then it seemed to be that now everyone who's got a diesel car and this and that. So what I'm saying is, whilst we may say that what China is doing is wrong, we might find that something that we've been doing is also wrong and causing damage. And actually, the CO2 isn't the answer. And that's, I just feel that, no. genuinely, do you think then, I'm going to ask you all yes or no, it is a yes or no, and so I'm going to start with you, Paul, should uh, richer nations pay, yes or no? No. OK, Philip, yes or no? Uh, yes, because our... No, no, because yes. we're, we're no, no, brought... no, no. Yes. Jim Dale, yes or no? Yes. And finally, Matthew Stadlin, yes or no? Yes. Right, thank you so much. Those, those are my, their thoughts. What are yours? Thank you so much uh, to Philip Blonde, former advisor to David Cameron, Jim Dale, meteorologist, Paul Burgess, climate scientist, and Matthew Stadlin, political commentator. There we are. Sorry for such a long video, but I hope there's been some good lessons along the way, as, as it were. It's just my way of getting rid of my frustration that I'm not allowed to debate properly. Um, I, I know it was three against one there. I noticed they all voted to spend more of your money. I'm not. I'm actually not voting to spend your money. It's not my money. It's your money. And the way these people vote to spend your money is just beyond belief when it comes to green issues. In fact, when it comes to most issues. So, you know, OK, I don't think GB News intentionally put it three to one. I, I don't think that was the case. I think they have a problem finding someone like me, actually. And I think this is why I'm on more and more now. Um, and that's good for me. And I'm willing to put up with a 13 hours travel for five or 10 minutes at a time because I want the message spread. That's what I'm about. Um, uh, as regards Jim Dale, well, I think the relationship's getting a bit worse, but maybe that makes us some sparks. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this video and I will thank you for watching. Bye.